is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Sorry, David. <laughs> For he founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome. Well, may that be our, our prayer today that we, uh, as we come today in Thanksgiving, uh, that we would seek, seek our God uh, today here in this morning. Um, welcome to all of you uh, and your families uh, coming and, and joining with us this morning. Uh, it is a good day. Uh, God is good. Yeah. Well, we are going to uh, have a few things to do today. We're going to have a Thanksgiving potluck uh, after the service this morning. Uh, so that will be exciting. Be Becky's going to have something to, to share with us today. Uh, we're not going to be worrying about, uh, looks like, pictures today for our photo directory. Uh, we'll keep going with that eventually. Uh, next one. Uh, also, just a, just a couple other announcements. A reminder, uh, if you have not yet known, if you are interested uh, in thinking about membership, uh, even if you're not interested about membership, but you would just like to know more about who we are as a church, uh, we are going to be having a membership class uh, on Tuesday, uh, so in two days uh, here at the church uh, downstairs in the fireside room. Uh, so come, uh, we've got enough printed out for everybody. If you want to understand who we are as a church, come out for that. Uh, we're going to be having, as well later this month, uh, another fellowship and games night on October 25th. Uh, it's a Wednesday, so come out, bring some games, uh, and just enjoy some fellowship with one another and bring a snack. Uh, other than that, Becky, uh, is there, are there any other announcements before I let Becky come up? Okay, we are doing pictures today. Becca is actually covering for her sister, so uh, so if you have not yet taken your picture for the photo directory and you're hanging around, and you're waiting to get in line uh, for food, uh, go talk to Becca, get your picture taken. Thanks, Becca. Uh, other than that. Becky, come on up. Speaking of pictures, I have uh, failed to do my duty that Charlotte asked me to do, and that was after I do these presentations to new babies, we need a picture of the family. <laughs> So I think I, I forgot four of them, but maybe maybe Becca can get a picture of those families I missed and get the baby in them, the new babies. There's four of them. <laughs> anyway, um, we have a brand new baby, October 1st, is that correct? And Heather and Jeremy, would you please come up? We have a um, New Testament Bible for Hannah. Hannah Grace, is that right? Yeah, and Cayman's coming too, that's great. And um, this, this rose got bigger and bigger. I picked it up a couple days ago. So if you just want to, you know, come on up here beside David and I, because he's going to be praying after. Yeah, come on over. So I always make a card, and the card is not from me. This is all from the, the Rolla Bible Baptist Church in, and, wel in, and welcoming Hannah Grace. And um, there's a card in here. There's also... Um, a New Testament for her with her birthday in it and your name's in it. I think I even slipped Cayman's name in there too. So Cayman, you want to hand that to Heather, that one and that one? Yeah. And um, in, in that card it says something about this is a very precious miracle from heaven, this little baby, and we're just so happy to have this little baby amongst us now. So I think I better quit talking and let you pray. What an exciting time for our church this summer with four new babies, and I'd like to say we saved the best for last, but, yeah. But I did have one of my own, so. 
But congratulations, you guys. Let's, pr let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, I thank you for, for Jeremy and, and Heather and, uh, and Cayman and, and little Hannah. Uh, God, we thank you for, for bringing Hannah uh, into this world uh, and under such wonderful parents. Lord, we just pray uh, that you would be with Jeremy and Heather as they raise this little one. Uh, God, I pray that they would raise this little one in, in your word uh, to know who you are uh, in love of you. Uh, God, we we just we know children are such a blessing. God, help them to know and understand how much of a blessing Hannah is to their lives. And God, help Hannah to know uh, how much of a blessing uh, that she has uh, with Jeremy and Heather and, and Cayman as her, her big sister. Uh, Lord, may uh, they, they teach her uh, all of your truths that she would walk in your ways. I pray. In your name we pray. Congratulations. Let's give them a hand. This. We're growing our church one, one kid at a time. I'm going to pray for, for offering quick. Invite our ushers up at this time. Thank you, James and Tony. All right, let's give thanks. Heavenly Father, we... We thank you for this day. We thank you for, God, all that you have made, all that you have given us so abundantly. Uh, your blessings here. Uh, thank you for the abundant grace, the, the, the wonderful, glorious riches of your grace that you have given each and every one of us. Lord, uh, as, we, as we give thanks, uh, Father, help us to also give back in return uh, that this offering today would be an offering of thanks. God, to you and uh, the marvelous works that you've done in our lives and for placing us here in this wonderful place, in this wonderful church with these wonderful people. Uh, God, help us to give uh, faithfully with our finances, God, that we, we would see uh, these just be a blessing to you uh, and to your work here. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> You'll stand and sing with us again.
Working? There we go. Well, it's a good day to be thankful. We're going to be uh, taking this time uh, coming together in prayer. And, uh, it's a, an important time, uh, especially here in this church. 
where we can share uh, our needs, uh, our praises, uh, whatever whatever is on your heart uh, that needs prayer. Um, this is a time to share it. Uh, feel free if you are visiting to there's something on your heart that you want to share prayer. Let us know. Uh, and we're going to be praying about it this morning. Um, I'm just going to open it up. Uh, any prayer requests? Margaret. Margaret asked for prayer for uh, what's happened with the uh, the attack on Israel uh, just these last few days, um, and then prayer for her brother-in-law uh, who is being diagnosed with a brain tumor and is going in for surgery on October 15th. Heather. for Neil Lewis uh, who's fighting lung cancer right now. Uh, Kathleen. Kathleen asked for for uh, her uncle, uh, who is battling with cancer as well, uh, and uh, prays for healing relationships in her family. Brenda. That was your your father or your father-in-law? Father-in-law. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bob and Karen had asked. Uh, to, yeah, ask us to pray uh, for them as uh, Karen is out with her mother right now. And as Angela said, it seems to be the last days uh, for her as they are at her bedside. Uh, but just give her, uh, give Karen and uh, her sister strength and uh, as they are there and for her mother as well and, and for your whole family. Pray for the salvation of Dave, for Brent, for Br Brant, uh, for Dave and Barb's uh, 
uh, son-in-law who does not know the Lord. Uh, his name is Brand. I pray for Dan. Tanya, Tanya. Yeah. Becky. Amen. Any others? Uh, Rose had asked us to, to pray for uh, her aunt. Uh, if you remember, if anybody met Mark last week uh, that came and visited with, with Rose, uh, his mother's taking off to Argentina for five, five weeks weeks. Uh, so it's flying on a plane today. Yes. So we can pray for, for Rose's aunt as she travels. Well, you know, it's good to feel like an auctioneer when I'm up here taking prayer requests. It's good. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we we again, we, we come to you today uh, to focus on, on thanks uh, uh, for all that you have given us, all that you have done for us. God, I, I thank you for the country that we live in, uh, that we can feel safe uh, when we close our doors. Uh, Lord, I, I, I pray for those in Israel right now that are... are not feeling that luxury. Um, those that have lost uh, lives from their family, the, those that, that have, have lost their lives uh, and that do not know you. God, we, we pray. Uh, we pray that you would speak uh, peace into this situation uh, as, it, as it unfolds. Uh, Lord, uh, above all, God, we pray your gospel to spread in the midst of uh, of of loss of hope and uh, and struggle and and heartache, uh, God, we pray, uh, God, that your comfort would come to those uh, who need it most of all. Lord, we we pray for. We see see many who are who are struggling uh, with health. Uh, God, we pray for for Margaret's uh, brother-in-law. As he is preparing for uh, brain sur or brain surgery on this tumor uh, next week, uh, God, that you would just guide the doctor's hands. Uh, you give them wisdom in what to do, and, and Lord, we pray that recovery would be be, be swift. Uh, we pray for for Neil Lewis. Uh, pray for Kathleen's uncle, um, Brenda's father-in-law. Uh, all who are who are in or, or are struggling, are in the hospital, or fighting. Uh, for their lives. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Brenna Mitron's uh, father as well as he, he battles with pneumonia. Uh, God, give them healing. Uh, grant them your comfort and your peace in this time. God, that they would not be able not uh, look uh, at this on with this situation um, 
God, without hope, but God, they would be grateful, God, for for the life that you have given them, uh, the grace that you have, have provided them. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for, uh, for Bob and Karen uh, as they are in Grand Prairie. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for Karen and her sister as, as they are with their mother uh, and preparing for these, these last days. And, uh, and as Angela said, we are, we are thankful uh, for the legacy that she, she left, God, for the life that she lived, uh, knowing you, and God. So we, we just pray, uh, God, as you prepare to take her into your arms, uh, God, that would be uh, without pain, and uh, God, that it would, yeah, it would be a peaceful time. Um, the Lord just grant your comfort over their entire family as they prepare for this time. Uh, God, we, we lift up uh, Zane and Michelle's uh, daughter Tanya as well uh, God with, with her healing um, God help her to, to look to you uh, in the midst of uh, trying to understand uh, this new uh, nervous function and, and how, how things are, are, are progressing God we pray uh, that she would look to you for strength God we, we pray uh, praise you we praise you for uh, for our families, uh, uh, as Kathleen has shared, uh, you know, praise you for for he- we thank you for healing relationships. Uh, and God, we <laughs> we know families are are complicated most of all, uh, and we all struggle with this in some way or another. Uh, God, and we we just we we thank you for our families. Help us not to take them for granted, even if we are. We're struggling in some kind of relationship. God, we, we pray that you would help us uh, to humble us uh, each, God, that we would we would always look for reconciliation uh, with those in our family. God, we thank you for uh, for the end of harvest. God, for this, this year, uh, despite you know, lack of rain and, and drought god we we thank you that uh, that many of these farmers are are able to get their crops off this this year um, and lord for those who are still going we just continue to pray for safety uh, as they do uh, we thank you lord for for the blessings that you have given becky and uh, and her family uh, it, during this this year of harvest um, god you are wonderful lord we we pray uh, as well for for all of those uh, in our lives that uh, that do not know you, Lord, we thank you for putting them in our lives. We thank you for putting Brant in uh, in the lives of the Peachy family. Uh, God help them to to be a blessing uh, to this man, uh, God, that they uh, would be uh, a wonderful witness uh, of of who you are uh, and and what a wonderful life that we can live serving you looks like. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, above all that you would speak into his heart, uh, that he would know you, uh, that he would be saved. God, we pray for for Rose's aunt as she uh, takes off to Argentina. God, give her travel mercies, we pray. Uh, And Lord, I I thank you for for bringing David Miller back from Israel uh, before this time as well. Um, God, I, I just thank you above all for our, our whole church, uh, for this wonderful family that we get to call our brothers and our sisters, uh, that we get to walk beside, uh, live life beside, uh, God, and, f- and follow you and to encourage uh, and shape one another. Uh, Lord, help us to have grace with one another, um, to encourage one another on. And Lord, I pray uh, as we get into your word this morning, uh, God, that you would speak through it to each one of our hearts as you've spoken to me. Uh, We thank you for your many blessings. In your name, amen.
Wow. If I was to to ask you to take you know a bit of a, a trip down memory lane, uh, you know, back when you were in elementary school, you know, maybe you were on the playground at recess, or if you were homeschooled, maybe you were just, you know, I don't know what you do at home, but you're just playing all day anyway. Uh, <laughs> how did you how did you convince someone? Uh, that you were you were telling the truth, or you know you'd you know, swear to keep a promise to them. Uh, what were some of the phrases that you would use uh, to convince someone? Just shout them out. Cross my heart. Yeah. Any others? Pinky swear. Pinky promise. Yeah. <laughs> Power in the pinky. Any? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely telling the truth this <laughs> time. There's a history there. Any others? Maybe you'd Becky? Interesting. Okay. Can, can do this. <laughs> um, maybe you said, like, Scout's Honor. Uh, you know, or you know, maybe you even said, you know, Swear to God, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm telling the truth. Uh, there are many ways in which, you know, sorry. Really, really, yeah. How many times have your kids said that to you? Yeah. <laughs> there are many ways in which, you know, we will try to convince someone, and we, and we used to as a kid, you know, that we're telling the truth. Uh, or, or to convince someone, you know, that we're, we're, we're going to keep our promise. Uh, in the in the days written about in the Bible, you know, this was really no different. The culture surrounding Judaism at the time was it was an oral culture. You know, just as we were kids, you know, the or, the oaths that we swore were sworn verbally to one another, uh, often in the presence of others, uh, as an observed covenant. Uh, and in our culture today, we I don't know. We we don't often swear oaths like we we did as we were kids, uh, you know, with our mouths, uh, you know. Other than you know, maybe unless you were in in a court of law and you were asked to to swear, you know, to tell the truth. Uh, but largely, uh, as adults, you know, I would say our oaths are probably more in written form, you know, the forms of contracts, legally binding documents. Uh, but whether orally spoken or uh, written in contract, oaths, really, they come with some form of uh, threat of judgment if they are broken. Uh, I remember when, you know, when I took out my first student loan uh, at our local credit union after I graduated high school, I had no credit history. You know, I'm 18. uh, There's no way of proving to the bank, you know, I can pay you back uh, what I'm going to borrow. Uh, and so, you know, my, my parents, they co-signed the loan with me. And I remember uh, they put a portion of our, la- uh, of our land on, uh, on this loan as collateral. Uh, and I remember feeling the weight of, of that, that, okay, if I don't get this back, you know, it's not even my land, but my parents will lose, you know, we will lose the farm. I don't know. You know, it's $10,000, but that's uh, nothing compared to what the land costs. You know, if I failed to pay the, the loan, the consequence, it was, it was great. Uh, oaths are always subject to judgment. And, and depending on the greater the oath, you know, the, the greater the consequence will be, really, it's to enforce that oath. Uh, but why is this the case? Why are we required to, to give more than just our word uh, when we're promising to tell the truth or, or promising to fulfill a commitment you know, such as taking out a loan. Well, the problem is uh, we're naturally untrustworthy. <laughs> the banks know that. Uh, we all know that. As humans, it's you know, in, our, in our sinful nature, we are liars. We, we are dishonest. Uh, our default is really not to be people of integrity. Uh, the problem is, is not 
it's not being a person of your word. Well, we're continuing in our, uh, our series, Wisdom on the Mount. We're gonna looking at you know, some practical pieces of wisdom uh, that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew ver- chapters 5 to 7. Uh, we've recently gone through uh, Christ's uh, first three statements uh, dealing with you know, the law of the Old Testament in which he gives us a radically high standard for living life in his kingdom. Uh, we, we have been exploring how Christ uh, didn't come you know, to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Uh, the Pharisees, you know, but the Pharisees, they had managed to, to work, rework their interpretations of the law uh, so as to actually to make it a little bit easier to follow, it seems. Uh, but in doing so, they actually found themselves guilty of the very laws that they were so righteously following uh, and flaunting to everyone else. See, the same case is found here in Christ's words on swearing oaths in Matthew 5, 33 to 37. You know, much like how last week's passage on divorce, uh, it's really about Christ's view, uh, high view and sanctity of, of the sanctity of marriage. Uh, this passage is much less the idea uh, of swearing oaths uh, than it is about us living out our new life in Christ, being people who are characterized by honesty and integrity. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to please turn with me to Matthew 5, 33 to 37. And Jesus said, Again, you have heard it said that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear on oath, an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is God's footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Well, so far, I think we've covered you know, kind of two points. You know, first, you know, our, our sinful, uh, in our sinful nature, we're naturally dishonest people. Uh, and second, taking an oath, it comes with a threat of judgment if that oath is broken. So we need to keep these in mind. Uh, as Jesus gives us these words in verse 33, uh, repeating what was said long ago within God's law, Jesus isn't, He's not specifically, you're not quoting one specific command directly. His words here are not found in a specific command in the Old Testament, but that doesn't mean that they're not found in the Old Testament. Uh, there are many passages uh, throughout the first five books uh, of the Old Testament that speak to the taking of oaths and the seriousness of fulfilling those vows that one makes before God. Uh, Numbers 30 verse 2 says, When a man takes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge. He must not break his word, but must do everything he said. See, there's a great seriousness uh, to making vows before God. And it was also something uh, so common and so ingrained in their culture that God made a special command against taking oaths falsely by his name in the Ten Commandments. And which one was that? Which of the Ten Commandments? Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Do not use the Lord's name in vain. Yeah, and we've kind of now morphed that into when we say, you know, swearing, you know, we're using these curse words or we're using God's name as a curse word or just flippantly in that sense, but, but really, this had to do, you know, also very much had to do with the way people took oaths. Uh, this command, it comes forward again in, in Leviticus 19, 12. Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Do not swear falsely. Do not take an oath and not fulfill it. Do not lie in taking your oaths in using my name. The oaths were serious business. If taken before God, you risk paying the penalty 
uh, of whatever was equal to the oath that you had made, uh, but also you risked sinning against God, uh, which as we know is the penalty of our sin is death. Uh, and this was the same uh, in this sense. This is why it is said in Deuteronomy 23, 21 to 23, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand of it, uh, demand of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do. Because you have made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. So basically, be mindful of what you say. Be mindful of what you say, and what you say, you're going to do. Those have to go together. Uh, As we continue to look at our passage here in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus is once again addressing uh, the hypocritical attitude and approach of the Pharisees uh, to following God's commands uh, on oath-taking. The Pharisees recognize that despite the simplicity uh, of understanding the command, Do not break uh, your vows with others. Uh, They recognized it was incredibly difficult to follow. Uh, And we saw this as well uh, in their approach to marriage and divorce. All right? It's impossible to stay married. I'm going to dislike this woman for whatever. And so we're free to, you know, it's okay to just divorce her for any reason. And that's what we covered last week. And so here we see the same attitude being approached. They thought to themselves, you know, surely, surely we're, you know, we're meant to follow God's law. Uh, but as it's written out in the Old Testament, you know, it's, it's impossible, really it's impossible to follow. You know, how can we make this easier to follow? And so, you know, they twisted God's law. They, by, by swearing oaths, you know, well, maybe instead of swearing by God, where we know we're bound, we're, we'll swear by something, you know, not, it's not God, but it still sounds nicely spiritual and will convince people that we're, you know, quite right. So we'll swear by heaven uh, or, you know, by the earth uh, or by Jerusalem or, as we said, by their own head. Uh, because by their understanding, uh, I am therefore not swearing to God and therefore I don't have to be as serious in following through with that vow. Right, I can swear by something else and have no intention of keeping that promise. That was how the Pharisees twisted that understanding, and how, and we can see how backwards really that is, just to make it so that they could follow God's law. John Stott said they developed elaborate rules for the for the taking of vows. They list they listed you know which formula uh, were permissible, and then they added that only those formulae which. Uh, included the divine name, uh, made the vow binding. One need not be so particular, they said, about keeping vows in which the divine name had not been used. But we see Jesus, he pushes back against uh, their example of this later on uh, in Matthew 23, verses 16 to 22. Uh, I've given you the wrong verse. 16 to 22 in Matthew 23. And in this, Jesus is, uh, he's addressing the same matter with the Pharisees. And he says, uh, again, verses 16 to 22, he says, Woe to you, blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if any of you swears by the gold in the temple, you know, is bound by that oath. Really, it's, you know, for the gold uh, was given as an offering to God, and so therefore it's, it's his. Uh, Jesus says, you blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. Because again, they're thinking of the gift belongs to God. The altar and the temple, they're just merely furniture in which God does his business and receives his offerings. Jesus says again, you blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. 
And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. As we see in Matthew 5, as we're looking at today, uh, Jesus, he's giving the same retort to this pharisaical attitude. It doesn't matter how you give an oath. It's always done to the Lord. Swear by heaven? Well, it's God's throne. Swear by earth? That's God's footstool. Swear by Jerusalem? God is the, is the great king of that city. And then he says, you know, do not even swear by your own head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. You know, they did have hair dye back then. That's, it's not as new of an idea as maybe you think. Jesus is saying, who, who are you to think that you can even swear on yourself? The w- one person you think that you have control over, you know, and get around swearing an oath to God, cannot even change your natural hair color. You know, whether you are, are old, you cannot turn it black again. When you're young, you cannot turn it white. You, you are God's creation. You are created. You are also God's when you swear on your own head. You have no power even over yourself in this matter. And so Jesus is challenging uh, this dishonest way of living. You know, he's, he's saying, don't use a whole bunch of fancy words, you know, swearing on this or that in some way to convince someone to believe you, to sound, you know, more, more religious or righteous, uh, when you do not intend to even keep on, on keeping the promise or commitment that you're making with someone. And J.I. Packer wrote about this in an article on Christianity Today, uh, speaking of the Pharisees being relationally phony. You know, they were just fooling folks. Jesus is, and Jesus said, in essence, do not let this foolery ever touch you. And so Jesus tells us, all you need to say is simply yes or no. And anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And I know, I, I, <laughs> I find myself, I struggle with this, you know, even when asked to do something. Uh, as I was listening to a Tim Keller sermon, he said, you know, as pastors, we have the habit of, you know, saying, you know, wanting to please, over-please, and so we overcommit or we say yes to everything uh, and then quite often let some balls drop. Uh, I know that I struggle with this. You know, when asked to do something, you know, generally speaking, my, my no, my no does mean no. I, I know that. But the, my yes can mean yes, but it can also sometimes mean maybe. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. You know, how how you say yes to something, how you say no to something. What is what do you actually mean when you say to it? You know, like if I say sure instead of yes, uh, I kind of give myself some kind of ability, you know, not to follow through. You know, when I really, in reality, should be s- telling someone, you know, tentatively, I'm going to say yes. But I will get I will get back to you on that, and then holding true to getting back to them on that. I struggle with that as well. As followers of Christ, you know we we should not need to take an elaborate oath to convince someone that we're telling the truth. Uh, in in our new life in Christ, we are to char- be characterized by honesty and integrity. Uh, as we've already covered, you know, if if you are to be salt and light in this world, uh, and even to others in the body of Christ, you must be a person of honesty and integrity uh, because people can see through that. If that's not there, it doesn't matter what else is. People see through that. Our, our world should know and your brothers and sisters in the church should know that your yes means yes and your no means no. That you're not trying to just pull the wool over their eyes. Uh, see, this is the standard that Jesus is setting. It's, it's the standard that God had set long ago in the law But the Pharisees knew, in my sin, on my own, this is impossible to follow. And so they twisted it so that they could find a way to obey it. But Jesus is not actually abolishing, you know, the swearing of oaths. He's he's providing them with this radically high standard of righteousness under Christ's kingdom. He's saying oaths come with a steep price. The beauty that we see, once again, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount is that the law, it, it pointed to Jesus. And now under Christ, you know, 
when we, t when we say we promise something, you know, we don't have to stand in fear of that judgment uh, that could be brought under us. That should not be our driving factor in, in holding to our truths. It's not necessary. As followers of Christ, uh, now under Christ, we do not have to be in danger of the penalty of death uh, if breaking an oath to God. That's a freedom that we get to live in now. And it's a wonderful freedom that we get to live in uh, that Christ has given us through the forgiveness of our, si of our sins. But we don't need to make oaths in order to put us into the state of fear for breaking them because we have been freed already from that steep penalty. Uh, instead, we are to live out our new life in Christ, being characterized by love, truth, honesty, integrity. Uh, that is why, why Jesus says uh, that anything beyond this it comes from the evil one. It comes from evil. Uh, whether the evil in our hearts uh, or directly from the evil one himself. See, lying or being dishonest is not, it's not befitting of the child of God. It does not characterize Christ. See, honesty and integrity, they're, they're kind of a big deal to Jesus. And I would even argue, as I've said, like they're, the, they're the foundations of, to living a life following Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Our lives are be characterized, be built up on the foundation of his truth. And that truth, all truth, should pour through us. And this means that when we find ourselves committing to something, that we should hold ourselves uh, to that commitment or responsibility you know, so that we will not become a liar. Uh, I believe... I believe that this, this passage, it points out two problems that we have in our nature. You know, our default, as we've said, is to be less than honest. Uh, it's in our non-committal attitude. Uh, even when we do make a commitment uh, or swear an oath, we, we don't really mean it. We don't want to commit to something. Our world pushes back against this idea of, you know, holding yourself to the vows that you make. Uh, our culture, it teaches us that you, know, you only have to fulfill your commitments uh, to the point or uh, to a, as long as it continues to serve your best interests. As long as it's still serving you, you know, fulfill that commitment. But if it's not serving you, uh, feel free to leave. Uh, your commitment of, you know, to, to working for someone you know, for, for a set amount of time, you know, only to quit partway through because Maybe you're not enjoying yourself as much anymore. You know, maybe we don't even, you know, we don't commit to, to a certain amount of time. And I think that's probably where Jesus is saying, I don't make silly oaths like this. But if you're going to say to somebody, I'm going to work for you for, you know, for the fall. I'm going to get through harvest season or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, you know, don't quit. You know, and so our, our, our world says, you know, well, it doesn't matter. You know, maybe we, we stretch the excuse that, you know, we, we, we quit and we say, well, it's just not good on my mental health. You know, I'm just, I'm struggling with this. Uh, you know, maybe it's just, uh, may if there's a legitimate health, health issue or problem, you know, sure. But how often do we make excuses uh, just to get out of something? You know, really just because life is hard. Because fulfilling a commitment is a difficult thing. Our world pushes back against the idea, as we've said, the coven of the covenant of marriage. Why, why saddle yourself with an obligation to, some, to someone else you know, when there might be a time uh, when you want to do something else freely or be with somebody else? You know, just, just live with someone without making the commitment. Or better yet, uh, stay single, sleep with whoever you want, have no responsibility. But we face the same challenges even in the church. Maybe you've resigned yourself uh, you know, to just sitting in the pew every Sunday, you know, keeping yourself from any commitment or obligation or responsibility to, you know, to the others in your church, keeping yourself from membership, from, from serving in any capacity, or maybe even uh, stepping up to serve on the board. Following through on any vow or commitment uh, or oath is, it's hard. And it puts you through the ring. But hard things aren't bad things. Just because it's difficult. 
You know, the, the question you have to ask yourself really is, and consistently, is who are you trying to serve? Who are you trying to serve today in your actions, in, uh, in taking a commitment, uh, in not taking a commitment? Uh, who are you trying to serve? Are you, are you trying to serve yourself in this? Are you, are you serving Jesus uh, in, in maintaining your integrity? Uh, if you can't do something, say no. Do not say yes with the plan, with no plan of following through. It's interesting how how Jesus works his way through these different problems of sin, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount. We, uh, you know, we covered murder, adultery, and divorce, uh, and they all seem to be pretty, pretty big sins in the scope uh, of things. You know, they're kind of the, they're the heavy hitters, as we say, you know. And then, and then here we are, we're dealing with this problem of lying. I think, you know, the more we think uh, of lying, uh, you know, we often think of lying as being you know, a lesser sin. You know, it's, what's a big deal if we tell a little white lie? Uh, you know, it's, it's not like one of the big ones. But here it is. Jesus is listing it, you know, right in, in tandem with, with these big ones. Tim Keller gave a sermon on this passage, and uh, he talked about, Really, uh, you know, the sin of lying is is more so like uh, you know, being a frog in a kettle. You put a frog in boiling water, you know, they're going to jump right out. Uh, kind of like how you know, murder and adultery and uh, and divorce they're they're these kind of big event sins. It seems really we know it's it's a whole bunch of little things build up, but they seem to be kind of these big event sins. You know, you do it or you don't. But you put a frog in boiling, uh, but lying, it's, it's more like, you know, we, we look at it, and, and it's, it's more like a frog in a kettle. You know, you slowly warm the temperature up in the kettle, bit by bit, little by little, and the frog's not going to jump out. He's not going to think it's too hot. And pretty soon, spoiled the frog. <laughs> See, constant little lies, you know, even, even just having that attitude of, well, Lying's not a big problem. I can I can tell a little lie here, a little lie there, and the more and more we do it, the more we become more and more comfortable with it, and the more we s- start seeing it as it's not a problem if if I say something and I don't follow through on it. It it builds up into a big problem. It'll boil us. So we must deal with our disposition towards even sharing little lies here and there because it just becomes easier and easier. So again, asking, who are you serving? Are you serving yourself? Are you serving Christ? I encourage you, put on Christ. Live your new life in him and put to death your f- flesh. Dishonesty in, all, in any of its forms comes from the evil one, from our flesh. And so that, that which we do not live in anymore as believers. So what does a person of integrity look like? Well, hold to your commitments. I think one of my best friends, you know, who decided uh, last year, he decided to stick with his job uh, throughout the year. He had started working for a neighbor farmer uh, only to realize the man was nearly impossible to work for. You know, he was constantly belittled, he was overworked, and he was really struggling any time I talked with him. Um, he was stretched right to his limit. He was having a rough, rough go of it. Uh, and he want I, I know he wanted to quit. And he said it, you know, a number of times. But he decided, he, he decided in himself that, that he wanted to keep his word and see it out to the end of harvest was his plan. He would tell me that, you know, he was going to see it through because he knew that God would teach him something even out of this hard time. That he'd come out of it somehow spiritually more mature. He didn't know how but he was going to trust God to see him through it. He had made the commitment. He was going to stick through it. And I can't tell you, you know, what God's going to teach you if you stick out your commitments when you say yes to something. I can guarantee you that you're going to grow in spiritual maturity and holiness as you go through those difficult times. Just, just ask anyone with a long and healthy marriage. You know, we don't know who we are going to, who we're going to be when we come out at the end of it. But when we stick through it, God will make you more like him. And when you say you will pray for someone, 
how often do we do that? No. How often do we say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you, and we, we just say it as a buzzword, and we totally forget. When you say you're going to pray for somebody, mean it, do it. Don't lie. Don't make you know, elaborate gestures just to convince someone or just to seem cordial or nice in, their, in conversation. Uh, just be someone who's known to keep their word. The best of your abilities and circumstances. Hold yourself to your word. And, and then I would say in that, give yourself grace. In that as well. Not, not every promise that you make you know, is as binding as another. You know, if you promise your child you're going to go play outside the next day and it turns out to be a minus 40 degree blizzard, you know, there's some grace in breaking that promise. You know, but if you vowed yourself in marriage you know, to your spouse, don't break that out. There's, there's some serious consequences if you do. Now, there's, it, it's not as black and white in that sense. You know, there's, there's a bit of a spectrum there in how to look at that. Be wise and, and be gracious. And when no one is looking, really, who are you? Because a lot of this comes down to you're going to say something, you're going to promise to do something, and it's going to be something that you promise to do on your own in secret. When no one is looking, who are you? Are you someone of honesty and integrity? Are you someone who is keeping their vows to others? Are you keeping your marriage vows to your spouse? Are you holding yourself to the commitments that you've made to others throughout the week? Does your yes mean yes and your no mean no? Just say yes or no and mean it. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. And not just to be heard. But I would say ultimately, as we see here on the screen, be honest. Be honest about your dishonesty. That's where to start, and to, and to keep and stay there. You know, when when you mess up, repent of your sin and sin no more. We're all sinners. We're all liars. We're all adulterers, murderers. But Jesus has given us this opportunity to turn from that sin and live in the forgiveness of His sacrifice on the cross. You see in Matthew twenty-one twenty-eight to thirty-two, Jesus says to the Pharisees. He says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. And his father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The Pharisees replied, The first they answered. And Jesus said to them, I truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes who the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. Even and even after you saw this, you did not you did not repent and believe him. So do not be like the Pharisees thinking that I'm a righteous person, but yet I do not keep my word. Understand, <laughs> none of us are truly righteous. We're all sinners. Repent of that. and Even though we've said no before, it's time to say yes and to follow through with that and follow God. Be honest about your dishonesty. Start living in the new life that Christ has given you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you above all for your word. And so often it is difficult to hear. It's difficult to hear uh, God, this, this standard of righteousness, uh, what we are called to live to. It's, it's so much easier to just tell a little lie. It's so much easier to just say to somebody, oh yeah, I'll pray for you and not mean it. God, convict our hearts, I pray. Help us to, to not be okay with, with sinning here and sinning there and, and thinking that we'll be fine. You'll just forgive us. May we not abuse the grace that you have given us. God, but even in the, these, as we see, think as the 
one of the littlest of sins. Uh, God, help us to realize that sin is sin. And you've called us to, to live in, in our new life, our new life of, in you, being characterized by you, Christ, in honesty and integrity. So God, we thank you. We thank you uh, even for hard words as we've been going through <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount. God, they're challenging to hear and they speak deep and they cut straight to the heart of our sinful nature. God, we can't do this without you. The Pharisees knew that they couldn't do it on their own and so they twisted it. Help us not to do that. God, but help us to trust that we have you. You are the one who has freed us from uh, the penalty of these oaths. God, and, and we can now just live freely following your example, saying yes or no. God, and showing the truth that you have given us, that you speak through us. So God, let us turn to you for help, for strength, God, to convict us, but to, to help us, to guide us in living rightly. We can't do this without you. So God, we just thank you. We thank you for this day, this Thanksgiving Sunday. And we can look to you and just say thank you, God, for all that you have done, all that you have given us, and this freedom that you have given us in you. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite our worship team up. stand with us.
give these words from Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts, and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. That's the call that God has put on our lives. Those who get to enter into God's holy presence. So let's strive to follow Christ in that same way knowing that we have been forgiven, that we can't do that perfectly. But he allows us to be able to do that. What a great God we serve. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to pray quickly for our Thanksgiving meal. There's no Sunday school. Uh, Whenever the ladies say it's ready, uh, we'll get lined up and we'll have some food. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you uh, so much for all the wonderful people uh, who have put work into making this meal for us. Uh, God, for our whole church to come together and put this meal on, what a wonderful thing. Uh, God, we thank you. We thank you for your love and for everything that you have done for us. Uh, Your son, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.